Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. A rigged wedding? Was it really like that and who needed it? In today's third part of the story, we will try to answer this question. Enjoy the show! You are listening to the continuation of the story. You can find a link to the previous part in the description below this video. Happy listening! 8.45 AM, Saturday, September 24th, 2022. Ryan had just returned from Sally's with his morning coffee and entered his office after collecting his reports from the night. He typically didn't work on weekends, but the DuPont case was too important and he expected Director Smith to arrive soon. For that reason, he had also asked Ray and Deputy Sanders to come in. He didn't want to ruin their weekend, but there was no way around it. Beverly had surprised him by agreeing to invite Elliot to dinner soon. She was still angry at the French-Canadian woman for trying to woo her husband, but felt better knowing Ryan had rejected her. Ryan was reading the reports when there was a knock at the door. Come in, he called. Sheriff, Deputy Director Smith from the FBI is here to see you, Elena announced, trying to sound like she handled such visits daily and nearly succeeding. Let him in, please, Ryan said. And call Detective Hale and Deputy Sanders to my office if possible. Of course, Sheriff, she replied, stepping back to allow Smith to enter. Ryan stood up and extended his hand with a smile. Looks like family life suits you, Ryan, Smith said with a grin. You seem to have gained a couple of pounds since I last saw you. Beverly doesn't let me go hungry, Ryan replied with a chuckle. I'm sure that's not all she does, Smith joked, and Ryan laughed again. How long will you be in town? Ryan asked. I don't know, maybe a day or two, depending on how things go, Smith replied. Beverly will rip my head off if I don't invite you to stay with us, Ryan said. You know we've got a couple of spare rooms. You could take one of them, even the one with the private bathroom. I appreciate it, Ryan. I might just take you up on that, on the condition you don't wake me up all night, Smith replied with a wink. No promises, Ryan joked. But I can offer you a pair of earplugs if that helps. At this point, Ray Hale and Deputy Sanders entered, and Ryan introduced them. Please, have a seat. Coffee? Of course, Ray replied, echoed by Sanders and Smith. Ryan poured each of them a cup from his coffee machine and prepared to talk. So, what's so secret that you couldn't share it over the phone yesterday? He asked Smith. It's this whole worldwide imports and exports situation, Smith began, opening his briefcase. By the way, Ryan, I spoke to my contact at the French consulate in Washington on my way here this morning. It seems someone sent them a copy of their file on you. A dossier on me? Ryan asked, slightly surprised. Indeed. So, I wouldn't plan a trip to the Louvre anytime soon, you're officially persona non grata in France. Well, that was never my plan, Ryan replied sarcastically. I don't speak French, and I can't stand snails. Don't knock them until you've tried them, Smith said, half-jokingly. Ray interjected to bring the meeting back on track. So, what did we find, Director? All right, getting to the point, Smith replied. Worldwide imports and exports has been the subject of an international investigation involving multiple agencies from at least four countries over the past five years. These include Interpol, the Charite du Quebec, the RCMP, the FBI, and others. We've gathered substantial evidence of crimes including human trafficking, illegal substances, weapon smuggling, and murder. Over the past two years, the situation has escalated significantly, thanks in large part to Mrs. DuPont. We seized enough data to conduct an operation at one of their remote sites. While we couldn't fully shut them down, they suffered serious losses. Afterward, her husband presumably left for meetings with clients south of the border. Wait, are you saying she cooperated with you? Ryan asked. Yes, Smith replied. But I thought she no longer worked for the Charite, Ryan said, shocked. That's what we wanted everyone to think, Smith explained. We created a convincing cover story that made it appear she'd left. In reality, she's still with the Charite, but as far as anyone else knows, she's no longer on active duty. She's been quietly passing on information to us. I suspect Worldwide Imports figured something out, that's probably why her husband was killed. 
So she was hiding it from us? Ryan hissed. Damn, I talked to her several times. Why didn't she say anything? She had to keep it a secret, Smith insisted defensively. She's undercover, Ryan. You know the risks. If she told you the truth, it would have put her life in even greater danger than it already is. And now that risk is significant. All right, I get it, Ryan said reluctantly. There are two former mercenaries at her house right now, he added. Are they part of this operation? You mean Roland Waters and Bill Matthews? Smith asked. Yes, they're involved. We needed to maintain credibility, so we enlisted their help. In exchange, they're receiving a monetary reward, and their records have been cleared. Damn it, Ryan muttered. What about that plane we have locked up at the airport? I checked. It's registered to our W Enterprises, Sanders chimed in. Smith nodded with a slight smile. Good move. Technically, it's a corporate jet, if you know what I mean. He put air quotes around corporate. CIA? Ryan asked, as if all his hopes for a quiet law enforcement career and an early retirement were dashed. They didn't need to be directly involved at the time, Smith shrugged. And the pilot you have under house arrest, he's also a corporate guy, but he's not complaining. He's enjoying his little vacation, knowing it's at your expense and you won't be suffering any federal expense reports. Ryan snorted. Ilya, Mrs. Dupont, told me yesterday that some of the people associated with worldwide imports are protected by diplomatic immunity. He gave Smith a tense look. What's being done about that? Mrs. Dupont has been identifying these individuals. She's provided us with the names of at least 15 people she's confirmed as participants. The State Department is working with the French government to revoke their immunity, but it's not an easy process, Smith replied wearily. Can't we just wave away their immunity if they're involved in a crime? Sanders asked, shocked. It doesn't work that way, Smith said, shaking his head. Immunity can only be revoked by the diplomat's home country. Friendly governments often cooperate if the crimes are serious and the evidence is strong. Even if they don't cooperate, we can have the person deported and hope their government prosecutes them. He glanced at Ryan. Sometimes it happens, he added, though he didn't sound optimistic. What do you suggest we do? Ryan asked. I've got three dead people in the morgue, the city's on edge, and the family's torn apart by grief. Nothing, for now, at least. I'd appreciate it if you could send us copies of the autopsies and your files for our records, Smith replied. Also, I think it might be useful to talk with Mrs. Dupont and her associates, but some were less obvious. Maybe over dinner at your house, as soon as possible. He smiled slightly. Not that I want to impose, old friends and all that. Maybe tonight? Ryan suggested, already thinking of how he'd explain this to Beverly. That works for me, Smith said. Have you ever met Mrs. Dupont? He asked. No, I haven't but I've heard things. Why? Smith responded, sounding suspicious. Let's just say she's a little, unusual, Ryan replied. Don't tell me, Smith interjected. I'd better make some calls, Ryan said, reaching for the phone. 10.15 a.m., September 24th, 2022. What's happening? Roland asked as Elia hung up the phone. We've been invited to Sheriff Caldwell's house for dinner tonight, Elia answered, sounding a bit distracted. Us? As in, all three of us? Roland asked, puzzled. Yes, all three of us. He's expecting us at 6.30 p.m. Her tone wasn't entirely neutral, and there was a hint of curiosity in her expression. Did he say why? Bill asked. No, he didn't give a reason, Elia replied. But if I were him and knew more than I was letting on, I'd probably do the same thing. Well, what the hell, I could use a home-cooked meal, Roland said. No offense, Elia, but I'm tired of takeout. None taken, Elia sighed. I guess I wouldn't mind some good food either, Jean-Pierre grumbled, forcefully hanging up the phone. Damn it. Damn it all. What's the problem? Tyre asked, shocked by Jean-Pierre's sudden outburst of anger. I couldn't recruit anyone, Jean-Pierre muttered. 
Everyone seems to know about Sheriff Caldwell, and no one wants to go against him, not even when I offer double the pay. How is this possible? Tyre almost spat, incredulous. How do they know about him, yet your planners don't? I don't know, Jean-Pierre replied. But apparently, they've all been warned. Looks like we'll have to rely on our own resources. I wanted to avoid that. Do you think they can handle it? Of course they can. They've been trained by the best, you know that, Tyre reassured him. Maybe, but I'm not sure they're ready to confront Caldwell. Have you read the file on this man? No, I haven't. Do you have a complete dossier? Yes, you should read it. Caldwell isn't someone who's easily intimidated. Then maybe we should target someone close to him, like his wife or children, Tyre suggested grimly. That's been effective before. Jean-Pierre shook his head. According to the dossier, this has already been attempted once. It's not confirmed, nor widely known, but our intelligence agencies believe Caldwell responded by wiping out the entire board of night petroleum in a raid that lasted only a few minutes. Wipe them out? Tyre exclaimed, stunned. Yes, Jean-Pierre said darkly. Or, as these Americans say, eliminated with extreme prejudice, all of them, guards and staff included, without leaving significant evidence behind. And the FBI did nothing? Tyre asked, amazed. The FBI claimed the raid was the work of a cartel from south of the border, Jean-Pierre said. The subsequent investigation didn't lead anywhere. But you don't believe that, do you? Tyre pressed. Neither do I, nor does the DGSE, replied Jean-Pierre, referring to the French Foreign Intelligence Agency, equivalent to Britain's MI6 and America's CIA. I've seen pictures of the destruction at the Night Estate. If he's willing and able to carry out such an operation on home soil, right under the noses of local law enforcement, imagine what he could do to us. He paused for effect before continuing. And that's not all. There's more? Yes. Ilya Dupont has aligned herself with two mercenaries, and they're currently living with her. Who? Tyre asked. Roland Waters and his partner Bill Matthews. Tyre sighed quietly, he'd heard of Waters before and had prepared a dossier on him. Waters was not only a skilled marksman with a .45 caliber weapon but also known for his brutality. Damn, Tyre muttered. Maybe we should back off for a while and let things cool down. No, we're moving forward, Jean-Pierre said firmly. But we'll need to be careful. According to Caldwell's file, he's married to a woman named Beverly who runs a farm and delivers eggs each morning. We'll keep an eye on her, and when the time is right, we'll strike. Yes, but we won't harm her. We'll just use her to leverage Caldwell's cooperation, Jean-Pierre added with a sinister grin. I'll get what I need to make her comply, if you know what I mean. Tyre watched Jean-Pierre carefully, sensing that his obsessive need for revenge was clouding his judgment and distracting him from the company's true interests. Yes, the DuPont woman had shot and killed Jean-Pierre's brother, but it had been in self-defense, and the man had been committing a brazen act of crime. We need to be extremely cautious, Tyre said. I've heard that the Americans have started negotiations to revoke the diplomatic immunity of several consular employees. For what reason? I've heard rumors, but I don't know the specifics. Are you on that list? Jean-Pierre asked. I don't know, I haven't seen it, Tyre replied. We can't let rumors slow us down. The job must be completed. Focus. Yes, of course, Tyre replied quietly, not convinced that Jean-Pierre was making the right decision. If it were up to him, he'd wait until things cooled down. But Jean-Pierre was known for his impulsive, often hasty actions. All right. Find out this woman's routine and report back by midweek, Jean-Pierre instructed. As you wish, Monsieur, Tyre said, leaving the office. When the door closed, Jean-Pierre turned to the window with a grim smile on his face. He would have his revenge. It smells amazing, Roland said, inhaling deeply. What is that? Pork, Ryan replied. With all the trimmings. It's Beverly's recipe, so secret that even I don't know what she puts in it, all I know is that it's delicious. He gestured to the man beside him. I'd also like to introduce you to Daryl Smith, Associate Director of the FBI. 
Mrs. DuPont, it's nice to finally meet you, Smith said, extending his hand. Alia looked at his outstretched hand, her face paling. Smith's smile faded slightly when he realized she wouldn't accept the handshake. It's nice to meet you too, Deputy Director, Elia said hesitantly. She doesn't like physical contact, Roland explained, shaking Smith's hand on her behalf. No offense. None taken, Smith said. I'm sorry if I caused any discomfort. It's okay, Elia replied automatically. Mr. Matthews, good to meet you in person, Smith said, shaking Bill's hand. You too, Director, Bill replied. You didn't mention we'd be meeting with the FBI director, Elia remarked to Ryan, a hint of irritation breaking through her usual calm. Well, there are things you haven't told me either, Ryan replied calmly. I guess that makes us even. Let's discuss it after dinner. Please, come to the dining room. I think Beverly has everything ready. Come on in, everyone, she said as they entered what Ryan called the formal dining room, a wood-paneled room next to the kitchen overlooking the backyard. Please, have a seat, Ryan said, introducing Beverly to everyone before taking his own seat at the head of the table, with Beverly to his right. Help yourselves, he added, gesturing to the spread. There's more than enough, so if anyone leaves hungry, blame yourself, he joked, prompting laughter from everyone except Elia. I really like what you've done with this place, Smith commented. The last time I was here, the walls were almost bare. That's all thanks to Beverly, Ryan replied. She's turned this old house into a real home. He noticed Elia looking around nervously, almost uncertain about how to approach her meal. Is everything all right? He asked. Do you need anything? Um, do you have any hot sauce? She asked quietly, keeping her gaze on her plate. Tabasco? I think we do, hang on, Ryan said, standing up. A few minutes later, he returned with an unopened bottle of hot sauce, unscrewed the cap, and handed it to her. He watched, slightly astonished, as she generously poured the sauce over her pork. She cut off a piece, tasted it, and nodded approvingly. This is delicious, Mrs. Caldwell, she said between bites. Thank you, Beverly replied, raising her eyebrows slightly. Everyone watched as Elia ate intently, not pausing between bites. Ryan, reminded of his army days, felt a little embarrassed but turned back to his own plate. This is fantastic, Beverly, Smith said. I can see why your husband's put on a few pounds, he added with a laugh, prompting more chuckles around the table, except from Elia, who looked momentarily bewildered. Before we got married, he survived on raw hot dogs and frozen meals, Beverly said with a smile. Believe me, he was skinny as a rail back then. I told him he'd probably prefer eating cardboard over some of those meals. Now I'm fat, happy, and not looking back, Ryan joked. I hope everyone saved room for apple pie, Beverly said. I picked one up from Piggly Wiggly today. Sorry it's not more fancy, but Saturday's usually our date night, and I didn't have anything defrosted. Why is it called Piggly Wiggly? Ilya asked indignantly, as if personally offended by the name. I have no idea, Ryan replied, unfazed. That doesn't make sense, Ilya muttered prompting the others to exchange curious glances. I think it's just always been called that, Beverly said, cutting the pie and passing out slices. They ate in silence, sneaking glances at Elia, wondering if she'd drenched the pie in hot sauce too, but fortunately, she didn't. She ate the pie quickly and mechanically, finishing first, then resumed staring blankly at the center of the table as if one social comment had depleted her capacity for small talk. After dinner, Ryan leaned back and took a sip of his coffee. Why don't we move to the living room, he suggested. Everyone thanked Beverly as they got up, and Ryan helped her gather the dishes in the kitchen. Is she all right? Beverly whispered to Ryan when they were alone. She seems different. That's just her way. Sorry, Ryan replied. I knew she was socially awkward, but even I didn't expect this. I almost feel sorry for her, Beverly admitted. Believe it or not, she has an impressive record with the Quebec police. If you say so, Beverly replied skeptically. Now go on, I'll bring the coffee. Thanks for everything, hon, Ryan said, kissing her on the cheek. And thank you for a wonderful dinner. You can thank me later, cowboy, Beverly teased, nudging him with her hip. 
Ryan smiled at her comment and walked into the living room, where everyone was waiting. That was great, Roland said sincerely. Yes, thank you, Bill echoed. You're welcome, Ryan said before turning to Elia. I think you owe me an explanation, Elia. She glanced at Smith, then nodded. You're right, Sheriff, she said slowly. Given everything that's happened, I do owe you an explanation. She looked at Smith again, who nodded reassuringly, then at Roland and Bill, before finally turning back to Ryan, choosing her words carefully. A little over five years ago, I was assigned to a task force investigating a series of murders connected to various other crimes, prohibited substances, human trafficking, illegal weapons. We had a lot of circumstantial evidence implicating a company called Worldwide Imports and Exports, but nothing we could directly confirm. Then we received a tip about a facility that was supposedly a lab and a stash for illegal weapons. We tracked it down and confirmed that the laboratory was fully operational. We took action to dismantle it, and that's when an improvised explosive device took me down. Between surgeries and physical therapy, I spent months in the hospital, eventually placed on temporary disability. After being discharged, my commander offered me a new position. While others thought I'd become a private security consultant, in reality, I continued working for the organization as part of a multinational task force investigating worldwide imports and exports and its connections to criminal activities. I was just assigned to lighter tasks. Lighter tasks? Ryan asked. Yes. Probationary officers are guaranteed full pay for 25 years, regardless of injury or health condition, as long as they accept an assignment. This is part of the collective agreement between our organization and the Police Officers Association, a system in place since the 1960s to help attract and retain talent. While I can't do field operations like before, I can still contribute, and the work was far more engaging than pushing papers in an office in Montreal or Ottawa. Interesting. Your husband worked for Worldwide, didn't he? Ryan asked. Yes, he did. But I never found any evidence connecting him to illegal activities. If I had, I'd have turned him in. He was just a customer service representative, nothing more. You're sure? Smith asked. Yes, Director, I'm certain. Worldwide hit its illegal dealings well, and nothing implicated Philip. His only real flaw was his inability to stay loyal. Ryan had expected some emotion with this statement, especially in front of strangers, but Elia remained as calm as if discussing minor theft. So your role was mainly to gather information? Ryan asked. Yes, Elia answered quietly. How did you do it? We can't discuss that, Ryan, Smith interrupted before Elliot could respond. Operational security. I understand, Ryan replied, noting that Elia's expression remained impassive, even after Smith's intervention. Did you ever discuss your work with your husband? Ryan asked Elia. No, only in general terms. As far as he knew, I did online security audits, nothing more. Do you know the name Jean-Pierre Gagnon? Ryan asked, noticing Elia's eyes widen at the mention. Yes. He's the head of security for worldwide imports and exports in North America. He frequently travels between offices in Canada and the United States, Elia replied. Is he involved in the illegal activity? Ryan asked. I believe so, though I haven't found solid evidence to confirm it, she said, casting a brief scowl at Smith, who ignored it. Different countries have different standards for evidence and definitions of reasonable suspicion, Smith explained. We have to work with what we've got, and it's not my role to prosecute. Can you think of any reason why you, personally, might be targeted? Ryan asked. Have you uncovered or said anything that might have drawn unwanted attention? Ilya shook her head, then paused, her eyebrows raising as if struck by a thought. Wait. This might be irrelevant but there was an incident a few years before I lost my leg. A man had taken a woman hostage, and I killed him during the rescue. His ID said his name was Emil Gagnon. I was acquitted of any wrongdoing, and I assumed that was the end of it. The surname Gagnon isn't uncommon in Quebec, but do you think Jean-Pierre could be connected to the man I shot? It's possible, Bill said. According to Wikipedia, Gagnon was the second most common surname in Quebec as of 2006. Really? 
Ryan asked, surprised. Yes, Bill replied, tapping his temple. I collect data like that. Check it yourself if you don't believe me. I believe you, Ryan said. Smith, do you think there could be a family connection? It's possible, Smith replied with a shrug. I'll look into it first thing Monday. Revenge is one of the most common motivations for murder. Ryan glanced at Roland, who seemed to understand the gravity of the situation but said nothing. Do you think Jean-Pierre Gagnon is capable of murder? Ryan asked Delia. Absolutely, she answered with such calm certainty that even the former mercenaries took notice. He served in the Canadian Special Forces, specifically JTF-2, which is modeled after the British SAS. International assassinations are part of their skill set, though officially deniable. Do you think he could stage a scene like that? Ryan asked. Without a doubt, Elia replied. Both Ryan and Smith blinked at her quick, unemotional response. They had expected more feeling, given that her own husband had been one of those targeted, yet she had shown more emotion earlier when asking for hot sauce. Ryan, Smith began, we've reviewed a copy of your French intelligence file, which means Gagnon likely has it too. Which means, Ryan trailed off, his face suddenly darkening. Oh, damn. Beverly! Ryan suddenly exclaimed. Yes, dear? Beverly asked, entering from the kitchen and wiping her hands on a towel. Do you still have your .410 shotgun handy? Ryan asked tensely. Of course, she replied, slightly surprised by his tone. Keep it close, Ryan said seriously. Ryan, if this guy is truly what Elia describes, then your department and her shotgun won't be enough to stop him. He'll be like some kind of criminal Rambo, Roland cautioned. Rambo had the advantage of surprise. Gagnon doesn't, not now that we know who he is and what he's capable of, Ryan responded. This is no time for you not to have a trench broom handy. Who said she doesn't? Roland replied with a sly smile. Bill took it with him when we crossed over. I've even got all the relevant documents. What if he hires other mercenaries? Smith asked. I wish him luck, Bill said, cracking his knuckles. I've spread the word, if anything happens, Ryan might just have volunteers coming to help. That's the last thing we need, an all-out firefight between Gagnon's mercenaries and your people in the middle of America, Smith sighed. Bill laughed. You know what they say, Director, old mercenaries don't die, they just go to hell to regroup, he joked. Ryan, Roland, and Bill chuckled, while Smith groaned. Beverly looked worried, and Elia looked puzzled. So, Ryan, do you want me to send the signal? Bill asked. Ryan knew that if Bill did, Hard Rock would be filled with enough men and weapons to take over a small country. He wouldn't have thought twice about accepting such an offer a few years ago, but things were different now. He was a respected member of the community, the people saw him as their protector, and he had come to see them as his extended family. He couldn't risk a deadly firefight breaking out between two armed groups. No, Ryan said quietly. He saw Bill's expression change and continued, maybe as a last resort. Otherwise, we'll handle this according to the law. Smith and Elia breathed a sigh of relief. Ryan turned to Smith. Can you arrange security for my daughter and her family? Ryan asked. I'll do it right now, Smith replied. I'd also like you to organize as many reinforcements here as possible, Ryan said. I don't want to either, he added, but I'll do whatever it takes to protect my family and my community. Let's hope the system doesn't fail us. I understand, Smith replied. They saw headlights in front of the house. It's already in progress, Smith said. Until this is over, you three will stay here, Ryan said to Elia, Roland, and Bill. There's plenty of room upstairs. Roland and Bill, you two will have to share a room. Beverly, I don't want you going anywhere alone. I know you don't have deliveries tomorrow, but you do on Monday. I want you with one of these three, okay? Beverly nodded in agreement. But I'll still need to feed the chickens in the morning, she added. I'll go with you, Ryan said. I have a few calls to make. So, why don't you three gather everything you'll need for the next few days? Any questions? No, everything is clear, Elia replied. 
Let's get on with it. Come back as quickly as possible, Ryan said. I'll be making a few calls myself. Who are you calling? Smith asked. First, the governor, then the office. Until this situation is resolved, everyone needs to be on standby. I completely agree, Smith said, pulling out his phone. Ilya, Roland, and Bill left the house. Ryan went to his home office and called the desk sergeant. After that, he made another call from his contact list, surprised when the person on the other end answered after the second ring. Good evening, Sheriff Caldwell. How may I help you this evening? The governor asked. Good evening, Governor. I hope I'm not interrupting anything important, Ryan replied. Oh, just another fundraiser, you know how it is. Yes, sir, I do, Ryan said. He then explained the situation and the steps he'd taken so far. Thank you for reaching out, Sheriff, the governor said. You have my full support. I'll make a few calls myself and will ensure you have everything you need. I'll pass on your number so my people can contact you directly for coordination. Thank you, Governor. I really appreciate it. Have a good evening, sir. I'll try. But I can only handle so many chicken dinners, the Governor joked. They ended the call, and Ryan immediately called his daughter, Sarah, and her husband, Bob. They were shocked but calmed down when he told them Smith was arranging their security. I hope these guys are better than the last two FBI agents who were supposed to protect Sarah and little Ryan, Bob said. I'm sure everything will be fine, son. I just don't want to take any chances, Ryan reassured him. Let me know how it all goes, okay? Absolutely, Dad. Just take care of your family. They ended the call, and Ryan went upstairs to change back into his uniform. Over the next 20 minutes, he took three more calls and smiled when the last one ended. Heading downstairs, he saw Beverly pouring another cup of coffee for Smith. Are you leaving again? Smith asked. Yeah, we're both leaving as soon as Ely gets back, Ryan said. I called everyone for a meeting to inform them of the situation. I can wait a bit, Beverly countered. You two can go. No, honey, I won't leave you alone for a second, Ryan told his wife. Why don't you go upstairs and prepare two rooms for our guests? Okay, honey, she replied. After Beverly went upstairs, Smith turned to Ryan. Have you spoken to the governor? He asked. Yes, Ryan confirmed. I also spoke with three of his subordinates. The local National Guard is mobilizing, and we're getting a small contingent of rangers and additional DPS officers. How did it go on your end? I've arranged security for your daughter and her family, Smith said. Agents and federal marshals from El Paso and Dallas are also on their way. They'll be here tonight or tomorrow. Great, Ryan said. As soon as our guests return, we'll head to the meeting. Ryan, I'm glad you're giving the system a chance, Smith said. I was a little worried you might choose a different option. I remember what happened with Night Petroleum, and I don't want to go through that again. Just then, Elia, Roland, and Bill returned. Ryan opened the door and let them in. He noticed a canvas case slung over Roland's back and instinctively knew it was his Thompson. Going somewhere? Roland asked, noticing Ryan in uniform. Yeah, Smith and I are headed back to the sheriff's department for a while. You three settle in. We're not sure how long we'll be gone, Ryan said. Anyway, make yourselves at home, mi casa yes su casa. What? Ilya asked, confused. It means make yourself at home, Ryan explained. You already said that, she replied sharply, her brows furrowed. Yes, he did, and he said it twice, Smith added. Beverly will show you where everything is and help you settle in. We'll be back soon, Ryan said. After kissing Beverly, he left the house with Smith. They got into Ryan's official truck and headed into town. What's going on, Sheriff? Mike Thompson asked as Ryan and Smith pulled into the crowded parking lot. Mike was not only the owner of a successful trucking company but also the commander of a local National Guard unit. I'll explain everything at the meeting, Mike, and thanks for coming, Ryan said, noticing Mike's camouflage field uniform with oak leaves indicating his rank. I know it was short notice. You're not kidding, Mike said. 
I got the call just a few minutes ago, and then the desk sergeant told me to be at this meeting. It almost sounds like we're about to be attacked by terrorists or something. Something like that, Ryan said grimly. Oh, hell, Mike gasped. The conference room was packed. Both duty officers and reserve officers were present, taking their seats. Ryan saw uniformed DPS officers and nodded to them in greeting, receiving nods in return. He headed to the front of the room, where he greeted Smith and Deputy Sanders. I want to thank everyone for coming on such short notice, Ryan began, and I want to thank our friends from the Department of Public Safety and the National Guard for joining us. I'd like to introduce Daryl Smith, Deputy Director of the FBI, who flew in from Washington, D.C., this afternoon. All heads turned to Smith. Many had seen his face on TV and were surprised to see him in Hard Rock. What's going on, Sheriff? One of the deputies called out. We have a situation that will require everyone's full attention until it's resolved, Ryan began, speaking loudly but with a somber tone. He then briefed them on the three murders and the information they'd uncovered in recent days. Turning to the map on the wall, he began assigning tasks. I want checkpoints set up on all roads leading into the city, Ryan ordered, pointing to various locations on the map. Since these spots are outside city limits, I'd appreciate it if DPS could take over these locations. That'll free up our deputies to double patrol the city. We've got it covered, Sheriff, the senior DPS officer responded loudly. Thank you, Ryan said. I've been informed that additional DPS officers are on the way, so hopefully, you won't be too stretched. Much appreciated, Sheriff, the DPS officer replied. I also want increased air patrols over the city. Can you handle that, Jim? Ryan asked the air patrol coordinator, Jim Thornton. We can handle it, Sheriff, Jim replied. What do you need my people to do? Mike asked. I need your team to support DPS and be on standby. The moment we locate the suspect, I'll need you ready to move in. But be cautious, the suspect is armed and extremely dangerous there's a chance he may have assistance. According to our information, he's a highly trained former Canadian Special Forces officer. You mean, like Rambo? Another deputy asked. Just then, Elaine entered the room carrying a large stack of papers. She began handing out sheets with a photo of Jean-Pierre Gagnon, taken from a video call, along with brief information about him. Something like that, Ryan replied. This is our suspect, Jean-Pierre Gagnon. He is currently the head of security for the North American Division of Worldwide Imports and Exports, a company based in France. He is a Canadian citizen and a veteran of the elite JTF-2 unit. Ryan heard several deputies whistle in admiration. Damn, one of them said. A real tough guy. Yes, so everyone needs to be on guard, and don't try to be a hero. It's unknown if he'll be alone, and we have no information on what he might be driving. If you see anything suspicious, anything at all, call for backup immediately. Don't try, and I repeat, do not try to act on your own. Got it? Everyone answered in the affirmative. Director Smith, do you have anything to add? Ryan asked. Thank you, Sheriff, Smith said as he walked up to the lectern. As Sheriff Caldwell mentioned, this situation requires full participation. I'm here because this is part of a multinational operation involving law enforcement and intelligence agencies from at least four countries. I'd prefer to take Gagnon alive if possible. However, if he leaves us no choice, we'll act accordingly. I'll be staying in the city until this is resolved. All right, let's solidify our strategy, Ryan announced. The group gathered around a large table with a detailed map of Hard Rock and the surrounding areas. Opinions were shared freely, with Ryan readily accepting suggestions. Proposals and counterproposals were discussed, some accepted and others rejected. By the end of the discussion, everyone felt confident in their plan. Sheriff, I printed out a bunch of these flyers like you asked, Elaine said, showing him a stack with Gagnon's face on them. Okay, thanks, Elaine, Ryan replied. Distribute them and post them on all public notice boards and other places where the public can see them. The flyers were clearly labeled, asterisk suspect is armed and extremely dangerous, stay away. Contact the sheriff's office or dial 911 immediately star. I also reached out to KRK, 
and they're happy to put out some public service announcements. You might get a call from Allison Channing, said Jenny Carson, the public information officer for the department. Great, Ryan said. Thanks, Jenny. He recalled his last meeting with Allison after Commissioner Higgins's murder. Anything else? I also talked to Tom Reynolds, she replied. Ryan knew Tom owned ABC Outdoor Advertising, which controlled several billboards throughout the city. He said he can put our flyers in rotation on his digital billboards as soon as he gets your approval. I like your approach, Jenny, Ryan said with a big smile. Consider it approved. When can he have it up? I already sent him the flyer. He said he could put it up in a few minutes, Jenny replied. Excellent. We'll make Gagnon's face the most recognized in town. Great job, Jenny, and I appreciate your initiative. Thank you, Sheriff. I'll get right on it, she said with a smile. Are we ready to go? Ryan asked the officers gathered in the room. Everyone nodded and confirmed with a resounding yes. All right, let's get started. Ryan stayed behind to answer any individual questions, leaving only after everyone else had exited. It's 2.30 a.m., Smith said. I don't know about you, but I could use an hour or two of sleep. Me too, Ryan replied. Bev will be up in a couple of hours to feed the chickens, and I could use some rest myself. They left the office and returned to Ryan's house, where they saw Elia sitting on the porch in a rocking chair. On the table beside her were a 9mm Glock and a pair of night vision goggles. 12.35 a.m., Sunday, September 25th somewhere between Houston and Hard Rock, Texas. Speak, commanded Jean-Pierre as he answered a Bluetooth call in his car. Are you on your way to Hard Rock yet? asked the voice on the other end. Jean-Pierre instantly recognized the caller as a private detective he'd hired to keep tabs on Elia and Hard Rock. We, oui, he replied automatically, momentarily forgetting the person didn't speak French. Yes, I'm on my way. Should be there in an hour. Why? You might want to avoid downtown. It looks like a police convention at the sheriff's department. Looks like every lawman in the area is there right now. Sheriff's deputies, DPS, even a few military vehicles, the man said. I also saw the FBI deputy director there. FBI? Jean-Pierre was surprised. Yes. If I had to guess, I'd say it's because of you. I don't think it's a good idea for you to stay at your usual place. You'd be better off using my hideout for a couple of days until things calm down, suggested the man. You know where it is, right? Yes, I know, replied Jean-Pierre. It wasn't much of a house, more of a small trailer about 60 feet long, with two small bedrooms. But it had electricity, water, a well-stocked fridge, a small bar, and decent air conditioning. It wasn't his first choice, but it would do for now, and he already had a key for emergencies. I've restocked the fridge, and there's a bottle of cognac, so you'll be fine, the man added. What about the target? Jean-Pierre asked. Mrs. DuPont and her two guests are staying with the sheriff, along with the FBI deputy director. I'll text you the address. There's a marker on the map at the safe house. Damn it! I told you, no names. Jean-Pierre shouted angrily. Sorry, sorry. I don't know what's going on here, but things are heating up fast. Maybe you should lay low until things cool down, the man advised. Jean-Pierre knew the detective wasn't aware of his full plans or business, nor was he paid to be. His job was to keep an eye on DuPont and the events in the city, send updates, and then maintain surveillance. Send the information, then keep an eye on them, Jean-Pierre ordered. Goodbye. He ended the call, feeling his irritation rise by the second. He heard a notification for a new email, and just then, Tyre's phone rang. Jean-Pierre looked over at his companion, who was staring at the phone with a pale, panicked expression. They know, Tyre croaked, his face turning several shades paler. Who knows? And what do they know? Jean-Pierre barked. This is a notification that my security status has been revoked. I must report to authorities within 24 hours for a security review and possible deportation, Tyre replied, his voice shaking. What should I do? I can't go to prison, I wouldn't survive. Jean-Pierre realized then that Tyre was no longer fit for the mission. 
he would be too preoccupied with his own fate at the hands of security services to focus on their task. Spotting a sign that read recreation area two miles, Jean-Pierre instantly knew what he needed to do. He didn't want to, but it was necessary, and he knew that, at this time of night, the area was likely deserted. Don't worry, Tyre, Jean-Pierre said. I'll make sure you don't end up in prison, not here or in France. Thank you, Tyre replied, relieved. Jean-Pierre turned on his signal and prepared to exit the highway. What are you doing? Where are we going? Tyre asked. I need to pee, Jean-Pierre replied coldly. You probably need a break, too. We've been driving a long time. Yeah, a break would be nice, Tyre said with relief. Turn off your phone, Jean-Pierre ordered. We don't want security services tracking us. Good idea, Tyre agreed, following Jean-Pierre's instructions and putting his phone in his pocket. By the time he finished, Jean-Pierre had already pulled off the highway and parked in front of an empty men's restroom at the deserted recreation area. Jean-Pierre got out and motioned for Tyre to join him. Once inside the small stone building, Jean-Pierre looked around and confirmed there were no visible security cameras. Without hesitation, he ended Tyre's life, staging it to look like a suicide. He took Tyre's phone and used the speech-to-text function to compose a message, pretending to be Tyre. The message read, I confess to the murder of Philippe Dupont of Worldwide Imports and Exports and his assistant Carmelita Holder. I also confess to the murder of Mrs. Holder's husband. I have loved Elia Dupont for a long time and could no longer bear to see her with Philippe. Additionally, I provided sensitive government information to third parties and falsified official documents to help assassins enter the U.S. I can't live with this guilt. Please tell my family I love them and apologize. Jean-Pierre signed the message with Tyre's name and sent it. He smiled as he received confirmation that the message had been delivered. He left Tyre's phone on, put it back in his pocket, and thought to himself, let the authorities track it. I'm very sorry, mon ami, Jean-Pierre murmured, but it seems you're now more useful dead than alive. You served me well in the past, so I gave you a quick death. I promised you wouldn't go to prison, and I kept my word. Perhaps we'll meet again, in a place as hot as Texas. With that, he muttered a final au revoir and calmly went to another urinal to wash his hands and face. He then got back into the car and drove off. Upon arriving in Hard Rock, Jean-Pierre went directly to the safe house. Using the key the private detective had given him, he unlocked the door and carried his belongings inside. After laying out his things, he drank a bottle of water from the refrigerator and then went to bed. 5.30 a.m., Sunday, September 25, 2022, Caldwell Residence. Beverly woke up early, as she always did, and looked over at her sleeping husband. After all that had happened, he deserved a rest, so she decided to let him sleep a bit longer. Besides, Elia had offered to join her at the chicken coop, and they had a lot to discuss. Beverly felt it might be easier without her husband around. She dressed in her work clothes and went downstairs, chuckling at the loud snoring coming from the other room, it sounded loud enough to wake the dead. She wondered if Elia was still outside and was surprised to find her sitting on the porch in a rocking chair. After making some coffee, Beverly stepped outside. Good morning, she said, holding out a cup. I brought you some coffee. Good morning, and thank you, Elia replied mechanically, taking the cup. Have you been out here all night? Beverly asked. Yes, Elia answered curtly. Where else would I go, in a house full of strangers? Well, are you ready to head to the coop? It's not far. It's over there, Beverly replied, pointing to the white buildings in the distance. Come on, let's take my truck. The two women got into Beverly's truck, a Ford F-150 similar to Ryan's civilian vehicle, and headed toward Beverly's chicken coop. Do you do this every day? Ilya asked. Of course. I have to take care of my little ones, Beverly replied proudly. I've cared for animals my whole life. The ride was silent, with a slight tension from Beverly and a quiet neutrality from Ilya, who didn't feel the need to speak. A few minutes later, they arrived at the main barn, stepped out, and walked across the cold, packed earth toward the door. Beverly unlocked it, opened the door, and turned on the light. The sleepy clucking of chickens surrounded them. Lord, how many chickens do you have? 
Ilya asked, surprised as she entered the large room. Hundreds, Beverly answered. I have a couple of helpers, but I like to come here in the mornings and take care of them myself. I think they like it when I come. Go ahead and grab that bag of feed. Ilya looked at the bag Beverly had pointed out and tried to lift it but couldn't. I. I can't, she protested. Use your legs, not your back. Like this, Beverly said. Ilya watched as Beverly easily lifted the bag onto her shoulder. She was amazed that such a small woman could handle the heavy bag so effortlessly. Mimicking Beverly's technique, Ilya was surprised to find she could lift it too, it had to weigh at least 50 pounds. That's it. Let's go, Beverly encouraged. Can we talk for a minute? Ilya asked as they reached the chicken coop. Beverly set her bag down, noticing that Ilya had already placed hers on the floor of the large coop. Of course, she replied neutrally. Do you want to talk about why you tried to seduce my husband? I wasn't trying to seduce him. I was just asking him for intim. It's a normal biological function, Ilya replied. Beverly chuckled, which seemed to confuse Ilya. I don't know where you're from, honey, but around here, asking for a night is considered seduction, Beverly retorted. I'm from Quebec, Ilya replied, puzzled. Does it matter? No, it doesn't, Beverly replied curtly. It's the same in Quebec as it is here in Hard Rock, Texas. Seduction is seduction, and intimate isn't just a biological function, it's the most intimate expression of love between two people. You were married, right? Yes, of course. Ilya's puzzlement grew. Then you must understand, Beverly said. We had an understanding, Ilya replied, still confused. Don't you and Ryan have an understanding? Yes, we understand that as long as we're married, everyone else is off limits. That's why marriage vows include forsaking all others. You remember those words, don't you? No, Philippe and I never said those words, Ilya answered, still a bit confused. We should have. Those words are part of every wedding I've been to, Beverly replied, then paused, realizing something. Did you have an open marriage? Open? Ilya asked, puzzled. Yes, where partners agree they can have a night with other people. I've read about those. Did you and your husband have that kind of arrangement? I never thought of it that way, but, yes, I guess we did, Ilya replied. Well, Ryan and I don't have that kind of arrangement, so I'd appreciate it if you respected our marriage enough not to offer yourself to my husband, Beverly hissed, barely containing her anger. I'm sorry, Ilya said quietly, feeling deeply ashamed. I didn't mean any disrespect. I accept your apology, this time, Beverly replied, a clear warning in her tone. Now, let's feed these chickens. 7.14 a.m., Sunday, September 25, 2022. Jean-Pierre woke to the sound of his phone ringing. Rubbing his eyes, he saw the call was from his private investigator in Hard Rock. Sitting up, he answered. Did you see the news? The detective asked. No, idiot. I was asleep, Jean-Pierre snapped. You should turn on the TV. Try Channel 7, the detective advised. Jean-Pierre grabbed the remote, turned on the TV, and cursed loudly when he saw his face on the screen. He was at a loss for words as the news unfolded. The people of Hard Rock woke up Sunday morning to see this flyer posted around town, the anchor said, displaying one of the hundreds of flyers distributed early in the morning. The report continued, according to this flyer, the sheriff's department is looking for a suspect in connection with at least three murders. The flyer identifies the suspect as Jean-Pierre Gagnon and states that he is considered armed and extremely dangerous. The sheriff's department asks anyone who sees this man to report it immediately. The broadcast shifted to Allison Channing from KRK News. Thanks, Brent, she said with a slight smile. This is why I chose this profession, she thought privately. She continued, in a statement released early this morning, Sheriff Ryan Caldwell said Gagnon is wanted in connection with three murders that occurred this week. Due to the brutal nature of these killings, Gagnon's previous military training and the potential for him to recruit others with military experience, the sheriff has mobilized the entire department and called in the local National Guard. Sheriff Caldwell stated, this department will do whatever is necessary to ensure the safety of this community. 
I will not rest until Gagnon is taken into custody. He also advised residents to exercise extreme caution if they encounter Gagnon, who, he said, is a trained killer. Brent, I'll turn it over to you, Allison finished. Thanks, Allison, Brent replied. In a possibly related story, a man's body was found at a rest stop about an hour east of Hard Rock by a family returning from Houston. No further details are available at this time, but Department of Public Safety officers are investigating. What do you want me to do? The detective asked. Do what you were paid to do, Jean-Pierre hissed. Keep an eye on Caldwell's house. Let me know what you see. Will do, the detective replied before ending the call. Jean-Pierre threw the phone onto the bed, watching it bounce before coming to rest on the floor. This Sheriff Caldwell will pay dearly for this, he thought. After finishing his morning chores, he took a shower and made coffee, as these Americans called it. After breakfast, he took a map of Hard Rock and began planning his next steps. 8.27 a.m., Sunday, September 25, 2022 Ryan woke to the smell of bacon coming from the kitchen downstairs. He glanced at his watch and remembered that he had promised to help Beverly with the chickens. Mentally reproaching himself, he got out of bed, went through his morning routine, got dressed, and went downstairs to face the consequences. You finally got your fifth place out of bed, Smith teased, sipping coffee in the kitchen. Yeah, well, someone didn't wake me up when she went to feed the chickens, Ryan replied, glancing at Beverly, who smiled at him as she cooked the bacon. Ilya came with me, she said casually. Besides, I thought you needed some sleep. Coffee? Of course, thank you, Ryan said, accepting the cup from Ilya, who suddenly looked thoughtful, as if internally wrestling with some deep thoughts. Everything's fine, Ilya replied, slightly annoyed. Why not? Ryan asked, glancing at Beverly and Ilya. He thought there might have been some conflict between them, but it seemed like they had sorted it out. He knew Beverly was still mad at Ilya for trying to hit on him, so maybe they talked it out. I hope so. Any news on our guy? Ryan asked. Not yet, but we found another body this morning at a rest stop east of town, Smith said. Is it true? Ryan asked. Yes, it was reported on the news this morning. But I received information from the Houston field office that the victim was identified as Tyre Ta Saint, one of the French consulate employees who was recalled. Apparently, he sent an email claiming responsibility for three murders. I'm betting on murder, Smith glanced at Elia. The letter said he had feelings for Miss Dupont. Did you know him? Ryan asked Elia. No, she answered plainly. I've never met anyone with that name. Do you know when this letter was sent? Ryan asked. I was told it was sent at 12.47 last night, Smith replied. 12.47, and this rest stop is only an hour from town. Assuming Gagnon headed here straight away, he could have arrived in town around 1.47, 45 minutes before we ended our meeting. It seems your gut feelings were right, Elia, Ryan said. They're usually correct, she replied, with a slight note of dissatisfaction. I think I smell bacon, Roland called out as he and Bill walked down the stairs. Damn, it smells delicious. Sit down, breakfast is ready, Beverly said. Do you need some Tabasco? Ryan asked Delia before sitting down, remembering how she practically drowned a pork chop in hot sauce the night before. Yes, Elia replied in her usual monotone. Ryan shrugged and handed her the bottle. He exchanged a worried glance with Beverly as Elia poured the sauce all over her eggs again. Everyone quickly ate breakfast. As before, Elia said nothing as she devoured her food, washing it down with hot black coffee, then sat quietly. That was wonderful, honey, Ryan said with a smile. Thank you, Beverly replied. Yes, that was excellent, Mrs. Caldwell, Roland said. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Beverly said, smiling. Is this how you eat every morning? Roland asked. Of course, Ryan replied. They say breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Everyone finished breakfast, and Ryan helped Beverly pack up the dishes. Everything's fine, he asked his wife quietly when they were in the kitchen. It's okay, honey, Beverly told him. Ilya and I talked a little this morning. We came to an understanding. 
Got it, Ryan said. At that moment, his phone rang. Sorry, I need to answer, he said, seeing that the call was from his office. It was Rhonda, one of the weekend duty sergeants. Sheriff Fred Tibbetts is here, she said. He says he saw the suspect. Ranger Wilson is also here, asking for you. Ryan knew that Fred ran a sunset motel on the outskirts of town. He was a good man who'd been managing the place for many years. Maybe Gagnon was staying there or had been there before, Ryan thought. Thanks, Rhonda. I'll be there soon. We just finished breakfast, Ryan replied. I'll let them know, Rhonda said before ending the call. I need to get changed and go to the office, Ryan announced. Do you want to come with me? He asked Smith. Of course, Smith replied. Ryan went upstairs and changed into his uniform. As he was leaving the bedroom, he noticed a flash of light through a north-facing window in one of the rooms. He looked out the window and thought he saw a small truck in the creek bed about 100 yards north of his house, off the main road. Bill, Roland, how are you with camouflage and stealth? Ryan asked, going downstairs. The best, you know that, Ryan, Roland answered suspiciously. Why are you asking? We're being followed, Ryan said. Smith and Elia heard this and joined the conversation. Do you think it's Gagnon? asked Smith. No, Gagnon wouldn't be so outspoken, Ryan replied. Besides, with his face now on every corner, he's unlikely to be stupid enough to come here in broad daylight. Most likely, it's one of his people. What do you want us to do? Roland asked. Go out the back door, circle around Beverly's farm, and cross the road. Then walk about 100 yards on the other side. You'll come to a dry creek bed. Approach this guy from both sides and bring him here. I'll wait until you get him. Any questions? I understand, Roland said, nodding his head. Bill did the same. What do you want me to do? asked Delia. Stay here with us, Ryan said. Okay, she said without argument, but Ryan sensed she wanted in on the action. You too, go, Ryan said to Roland and Bill. They nodded and quietly walked up the back door. Ryan went upstairs, grabbed the binoculars from the bedroom, and moved away from the window. He began observing the area across the street. He saw the man hiding behind the bushes and then noticed Roland and Bill sneaking up on him. Within minutes, the man found himself face to face with Roland's Thompson. When Ryan, Smith, and Elia went outside, Roland and Bill were leading the prisoner across the street. Ryan recognized him immediately, it was Sam Grayson, Hard Rock's only private investigator. When they got to Ryan, they stopped and Sam looked at them nervously. Well, if it isn't Sam Grayson, Ryan said with a smile. Why were you watching my house, Sam? Do you work for Jean-Pierre Gagnon? Sam's face paled at the mention of Gagnon's name. I won't say anything, Sam hissed. Give me five minutes with him, Sheriff, and he'll tell you everything, Elia hissed in response. Oh, he'll tell us everything, won't he, Sam? Ryan asked with a sly smile and a creepy wink. Turn around, hands behind your back, Ryan said. He handcuffed Sam, reading him his Miranda rights, then searched him, finding no weapons or illegal substances. Ryan shoved Sam into the back seat of his company pickup. We're leaving. I don't know when we'll be back. Do you need anything from the store? Like more Tabasco? He asked Delia. If I may, she replied, adding an awkward please. Do you need anything, honey? Ryan asked Beverly. No, it's okay, she replied. Okay, I'll call you when we get back, Ryan said, and then he and Smith got into the pickup truck and headed into town. When they arrived at the sheriff's department, Ryan pulled Sam out of the truck and led him inside, handing him over to Deputy Jones. Take Mr. Grayson to interrogation room one, please, Ryan said. Right away, Sheriff, Jones replied, leading Sam down the hallway. Ryan and Smith continued to the front of the department, where Ryan saw Fred and a tall man in a dark suit and cowboy hat, a ranger. Ryan nodded to the ranger and then turned to Fred. How can I help you, Fred? Ryan asked. That guy Gagnon, the one on TV. He stayed at my motel, Fred said. More than once. I recognized his face from the morning report. 
Is he there now? Ryan asked. No, Sheriff, he's not, but I checked my notes to make sure it's the same guy. I made a copy for you, Fred said, handing Ryan the folder. Ryan looked at Fred's registration records and saw that Gagnon and another person were there on March 11th, the last day Philippe Dupont and Carol Holder were alive. It states that there was another person with Gagnon in March, Ryan said. Yeah, he always came with that guy, Fred replied. For a while, I thought they were, you know, together. Ryan had to think about it for a moment before it dawned on him. Got it, Ryan said. Do you remember the name of the second man? Yeah, his name was something like Terry. I don't remember exactly now, but I definitely remember that guy Gagnon calling him that, Fred said. Thanks, Fred, Ryan said. I really appreciate it. Always happy to help, Sheriff, Fred replied. How's be doing lately? Ryan asked, referring to Fred's wife. Her arthritis has been worse lately, Sheriff, but other than that, she's fine, Fred replied. Hey, why don't you take this nice woman out to a steakhouse for a full course dinner, at my expense? Ryan said, holding out a $50 bill from the wad of money he kept in his pocket. Why, thanks, Sheriff. Fred exclaimed with a big smile. I really appreciate it, and I know B will be delighted. Have a nice day. Be careful, Ryan said. I will, and thanks again, Fred said, and then they shook hands. When Fred left the office, Ryan turned to Ranger Wilson. How can I help you, Ranger? Ryan asked. I must say, Sheriff, you have a rather unusual way of doing things, Wilson responded skeptically. It's called community outreach, Ryan said. I read about it in one of the online courses. I consider these people my friends, in a way, part of my extended family. Yeah, Wilson replied. The place looks like an armed camp. Sheriff, are you sure this is the right decision? You didn't see what was done to the victims, Ranger. I did, Wilson almost spat. And I know he did it, and I'm damn sure I won't let him do it again to anyone from my town. The captain says you've attracted the Canadians, Wilson said, narrowing his eyes. The Canadians were involved long before these bodies were discovered, Smith interrupted. Wilson turned his attention to him. Smith, right? I saw you on TV, he said. Yes, actually, I'm FBI Deputy Director Smith, Wilson replied. And there's a lot more going on here than you know. Maybe if you keep your eyes and ears open and your mouth closed, you can learn something new without looking stupid. Smith smiled slightly. Wilson nodded his head without saying anything. I'm going to do the interrogation, Ryan said. If you behave quietly and calmly, I'll allow you to be present. I appreciate it, Sheriff, Wilson said. Ryan noticed the smile on Rhonda's face as he turned to leave the front desk. This way, Ryan commanded. Smith and Ranger Wilson followed him to his office, where he grabbed the file, and then to interrogation room one, where Sam was waiting. Ryan and Smith sat across from Sam, and Ryan motioned for Wilson to take a chair against the wall. Ryan began the audio recording of the interrogation, making the necessary opening remarks. I know your rights have been read to you, Mr. Grayson. Do you understand them as I explain them to you? Ryan asked. Yeah, Sam grumbled. You don't seem to enjoy visiting my little corner of heaven, Mr. Grayson, Ryan chuckled. If I didn't know better, I'd think you were guilty of something. No comment, Sam replied. I haven't asked anything yet, Ryan said. Tell me, Mr. Grayson, how long have you been working for Jean-Pierre Gagnon? Ryan asked, placing photos of the dead on the table so Sam could see them. They watched as Sam struggled to hold back the urge to vomit. No comment, Sam replied, turning his face away from the photographs. Ryan adjusted the pictures so Sam had to look at them again. What happened, Mr. Grayson? You didn't know what kind of business your client was in? Ryan said quietly. Give him a chance, and he'll do it again and again. Maybe one day, he'll do it to you. It won't take him long to figure out you've been brought in for questioning. I'm sure he's smart enough to put the two together. Isn't that right, Ranger? Of course, Wilson replied with a grin. 
You wouldn't dare, Sam exclaimed, his face white and his eyes nearly popping out of his head. I wouldn't dare. After what your client has already done, and what he might do again. We have three bodies that we know are connected to him, and possibly one more. Do you really want to risk it? Ryan asked. Now tell me, Grayson, where's your client, and what has he asked you to do? Work with me, Mr. Grayson, and I'll help you as much as I can. How can I know that you'll keep your word? Sam asked. Because I just gave it to you. Your client, on the other hand, has a bad habit of killing anyone who crosses his path or gets in his way. Will you work with me, or do you want to take your chances with a train assassin? Sam's face paled even more as he thought about Ryan's words. I had to keep an eye on that Canadian woman, Mrs. DuPont. That's all. I won't say anything more without a lawyer, Sam replied. And that's why you spied on my house? Ryan asked. I said I wouldn't say a word until my lawyer was here, Grayson repeated. Okay, Mr. Grayson, who's your lawyer? We'll get him here for you, Ryan said. Arnold Gillespie, Sam said. But he's out of town and won't be back until Monday. Then it looks like you'll have to experience our Texan hospitality for a while, Ryan said sarcastically, causing Smith and Wilson to grin. He knew that Grayson was from New York and had the personality to match. But know this, Mr. Grayson, Ryan added. If anyone else is killed between now and then, you will be considered an accomplice. I will personally see to it. The interrogation is over, Ryan stopped the recording, collected the photos, and stood up. Smith and Wilson joined him, and they left the room. Ryan called a deputy to take Sam to the county jail. What about his truck? asked Smith. It's still there in that riverbed. I'll send someone to pick it up and turn it over to Ron's team, Ryan said. We'll also check Grayson's phone. Gagnon is here somewhere, and this man knows where. If this Gagnon is what you say, he can just as easily eliminate his targets from a distance with a sniper rifle, Wilson protested. Perhaps, but that's not his style, Ryan said indifferently. This guy is crazy. You sound like you've dealt with these types before, Wilson replied, looking at Ryan with narrowed eyes. A couple of times, Ryan answered through gritted teeth. Come with me, Ryan said, leading them to the morgue. Yeah, I got it, Wilson said, slightly shocked. What is required of me? Jean-Pierre studied the map on the table in front of him, sipping from a bottle of water. He had been hoping to hear from Grayson until now and wondered what was going on. He took out his phone intending to call, but changed his mind. Something felt wrong, but he couldn't figure out what it was. Then his phone rang, making him jump. Hoping it was Grayson, he looked at the screen and felt the world around him suddenly stop. It wasn't Grayson. It was his boss from Montreal with a simple message, asterisk from now on, your services are no longer required. Asterisk. Jean-Pierre was filled with anger and confusion. He turned on the TV, cursing the weird cable menu until he found the channel he wanted. The screen immediately showed a well-dressed man in a dark suit standing in front of an official government building. The State Department just announced the expulsion of more than a dozen French consulate employees, whom the administration accuses of participating in a criminal organization associated with worldwide imports and exports a large French company with offices throughout North America, the man in the suit said. One of these employees was killed at a rest stop west of Houston, Texas, this morning. Officials say it may be connected to a series of murders in the southwest Texas town of Hard Rock. The bodies of two employees were found there, along with the spouse of one of these employees, a few days ago. According to reports, the main suspect is Jean-Pierre Gagnon, a Canadian citizen and the current head of security for the North American subsidiary of worldwide imports and exports. We also learn that Gagnon is connected with the expelled employees of the consulate. A photo of Jean-Pierre appeared on the screen, the same one that Ryan had distributed throughout the city. Now the whole world saw it, because ZNN usually broadcasts its reports live on the internet and publishes them on social networks. Ah. Jean-Pierre shouted as the reporter continued, his face red with rage. He stopped himself from hitting the wall of the trailer, it wouldn't do any good. He tried to reply to the message but found that his number was blocked. He tried to call his boss in Montreal but was rudely rejected by his assistant, 
who made it clear that his participation was no longer needed or required. As a result, Jean-Pierre found himself alone, completely cut off from everything and everyone. He had been thrown under the bus by the very people who had hired him to build their criminal network. Now they were probably frantically trying to save themselves. They will pay, just as Caldwell and everyone else will pay, with their lives, Jean-Pierre thought, furious. After recovering from his fit of rage, Jean-Pierre began to consider his options. It became clear that Grayson had not made contact because he was already in Caldwell's hands, and this, he assumed, meant that Caldwell would soon find out about his hideout. He looked out the window and decided to wait until nightfall before moving on, hoping Caldwell wouldn't find him first. Meanwhile, at the Caldwell house. What are you doing? Ilya asked Roland as she entered the front room of the Caldwell house. Roland took his Thompson apart and carefully cleaned and lubricated its parts. I'm giving the old lady a good cleaning, just in case, Roland said. Old lady? Ilya raised an eyebrow in surprise. This thing dates back to World War II. That makes it about 80 years old, Roland said. And this old lady is still accurate and reliable. After all these years? Ilya asked in surprise, amazed that such an old weapon was still in use. Oh, yes, Roland answered proudly, wiping down the parts. He glanced at her when she hesitated. Can I ask you something? Of course, he replied. Have you ever been married? Yes, once a long time ago, Roland answered sadly. He fell silent, lost in memories, then continued, in fact, this is not entirely true. I was married three times, he admitted tiredly. Why three times? What happened? Ilya asked. They cheated on me, all three of them. The sadness in his voice made her shiver uncomfortably. You didn't have an agreement with them? Ilya asked. You mean, how is it with you and Philip? Roland asked. No, we took an oath to reject everyone else. I did, but my wives didn't. After divorcing my second wife, I served until the end of my term in the army and became a freelancer, Roland recalled. I thought I hit the jackpot with Susan. She was my third wife. That also turned out to be a lie. I'm so sorry, Elia said quietly, struggling to find the right words. She extended her hand to Roland but withdrew it, as if she had touched a hot stove. Roland noticed this but said nothing, surprised that she even tried. It's not your fault, Roland told her. What happened to Susan? She was taken away by a rival who wanted to hurt me more than be with her. She didn't understand that. Oh, you mean, how did it end officially? Ilya asked. I divorced her for abandoning the family a year after she left with her lover. She and her lover are dead. Did you have anything to do with this? Ilya asked indirectly. We found out that her lover, my old enemy, was going to sell her into slavery. We tried to save her, almost succeeded. Roland again plunged into painful memories. I wouldn't take her back, but even after what she did, she didn't deserve what he was going to do to her. Have you met anyone since then? She continued to ask. Yes, I met quite a few women. I even slept with some of them. And no, none of them worked for the Russians, he laughed. Russians? Ilya didn't understand. It's an old joke, said Roland, sighing. Damn tiring. Ilya replied with a glance at the table as Roland collected his weapon. I wanted to ask, have you met anyone special? Someone you might want to marry one day? Roland paused, thoughtful, carefully choosing his words. Was she really fishing for some information? Now he was confused. I met a couple of people. Unfortunately, both were married, and no, I didn't sleep with them. I may be many things, but I'm not a homewrecker, he said. What if they weren't married? Ilya asked. Then perhaps it would change the situation. Why all these questions? Just curious, she replied. Yeah, well, I can tell you this, Roland said, his expression serious. I could never live in a relationship like you and Philip. In my opinion, if you want to walk around like you're single, then you have no business being married. But this is just my opinion, for what it's worth. Elias' brow furrowed as if she were pondering a deep philosophical problem. 
Roland sighed heavily. I will say this, if you are a patriot, if you can be trusted, you play 100% for one team or one country. You cannot be 80% patriotic and work for China, North Korea, or Iran, Roland said, checking the barrel's alignment and jerking the bolt, noting with satisfaction how smoothly the mechanism worked even after all these years. For people, he continued, any intimate time spent with someone you don't love is stealing from the one you claim to love, even if you're not in bed with them at the time. Even if they are on the other side of the world. You can write them a letter, make a video call, plan a party, or do something they don't expect just to show them how much, well, how much you care about them. For example, from buying the pool table they always dreamed of, to creating the garden they said they dreamed of. He stopped, realizing he was picking at old scars that he thought had long since healed, but perhaps, after so many years, they had only gone numb. I think I understand, Ilya said slowly. Well, I put it back together, Roland said, raising his weapon. Do you want to go into the yard and shoot? See how it feels. Of course, Ilya replied with a slight smile. I've never shot with an old lady before. Everyone gathered at Ryan and Beverly's dinner table a little earlier than the day before. With the exception of the menu, almost everything was the same as the day before. You put Tabasco on this, and you'll wear it, Beverly joked as she placed the lasagna on the table. I never put Tabasco on lasagna, Elia replied in her monotone voice. What's happening? Roland asked. We're having dinner a little earlier today, aren't we? Ryan said, as he played with the lasagna. If Gagnan is going to act, he will do it tonight, after dark. I want to be ready when he moves. We have sheriff's deputies and National Guard troops deployed in the area, Smith explained. We also have an ambulance just down the road, waiting for our signal in case we need it. We're going to give Gagnan a chance to get as close as possible before anything happens. Don't worry, he's from here. This won't work. He looked at Elia before continuing. I've spoken to our people in Montreal. The police and Royal Canadian Mounted Police will begin operations tomorrow morning at Worldwide's North American headquarters. French authorities will simultaneously conduct an operation in Marseille. If all goes according to plan, it will all be over by this time tomorrow. We will also begin operations at their other offices in the States. So, it will all be over soon. Ilya nodded. That's the plan. We've been working on this for years. I thought you'd be happy. Yes, of course. I'm glad, Ilya said, though her face showed otherwise. If this ends, I will probably be offered another position, perhaps in Montreal or Ottawa. She looked at Roland, and a shadow of sadness flashed across her face, which did not escape those around her. Almost everyone was surprised. I hope this won't be boring paperwork, Smith said. I'm confident everything will be fine, Smith added. I hope so, Elia replied. They finished their meal, ending with a slice of apple pie. When they finished, Ryan helped Beverly clear the table while the others moved into the living room to prepare for what Ryan and Smith thought was going to happen. Make sure you wear this, Ryan said as he handed out sets of level 3 body armor to Smith, Elia, Roland, and Bill. I know it's not the best, but it's better than nothing. I've been asking for more modern stuff, but Commissioner Barnes says it's not a priority since we don't have a lot of gun crimes here. Thank you, Smith said, picking up his vest. If I knew we were going into a firefight, I would have brought something better than this. Are you okay? Roland asked Delia as she checked her weapon. Yes, she answered simply. She looked at Roland and stood face to face with him, which took him by surprise. Be careful, Roland, please she said softly. I can handle it, he told her. This is not my first rodeo, you know. I know. It's just, everything will be fine, Ilya, he emphasized. He wanted to say something else, but couldn't. Ilya suddenly stepped forward and kissed him. He was stunned. She abruptly pulled away from the kiss and stepped back. Be careful, she whispered, so intensely that everyone could hear. No one moved or said a word. Ah, yes, I will, Roland replied, unsure of what to think of her actions. It was the first time she had kissed him, something she hadn't done even when they had an intim. Strangely, he felt closer to her in that short moment than he had ever felt before. 
Something stirred inside him that he thought had long died and been buried deep. The earth calls for you, Bill said, after Ilya left. Roland turned to his old friend and comrade. What the hell just happened? No idea, Roland replied. Everyone except Beverly ignored their conversation. She just shook her head, understanding, and muttered under her breath, Men. Your mouth says it, but your eyes say something else. Bill chuckled. Are you falling in love with her? It was just a kiss, Roland protested, half seriously. Yeah, sure. Just a kiss, Bill said with a grin. But you know, I'd keep my head down. This isn't the best time for romance. Let's focus on the matter at hand, okay? Yes, you're right, Roland admitted, still not believing what had just happened. But Bill was right, now is not the time to think about feelings. He checked his equipment one more time and prepared himself for what might happen. Smith listened through his earpiece, then nodded. Charlie Six reports he's on his way, coming from the southeast, heading toward the back of the house. We're waiting for him. Don't scare him away. Let him come as close as possible, Ryan ordered. They didn't have to wait long. An hour later, one of the flashbang signals that Roland had installed in Ryan's backyard went off. Everyone except Beverly ran out of the house and took their positions, carefully scanning the surroundings. Suddenly, they heard a man's voice. Well, well, Sheriff, the man called. Or should I call you Whiskey Delta One? We're finally face to face. They turned toward the voice, holding their weapons at the ready. As you wish, Ryan responded loudly. Come forward so we can see you. Not until you put your weapon down, Sheriff. Take it slow and keep your hands where I can see them, Gagnan said. Looking around, Ryan nodded slowly, placed his gun on the ground, and stood up straight, holding his hands in front of him. The others followed suit. You're not getting out of here, Gagnan. We're going to take you dead or alive. I honestly don't care, Ryan said loudly. I walked past your deputies and National Guard soldiers, Sheriff. I could take them all out myself. I'll get out of here no problem, Gagnan replied. Oh yeah? Ryan said, his voice dripping with sarcasm. Night vision, low light scanners, and the National Guard just waiting to play with the new silent drone with radar to track moving targets. Has it ever occurred to you that they were ordered to let you through? Or has your arrogance clouded your judgment? Ha ah, don't insult my intelligence, Sheriff, Gagnan said, stepping forward with two weapons in his hands, strapped to his shoulders. Ryan thought about the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie and held back his laughter. Even with the weapons having low recoil, Ryan knew Gagnan wouldn't be able to control the fire adequately. It was more of a show of force than a real threat. What do you want? Ilya asked, venom in her voice. Ah, here comes the expletive, Gagnan chuckled. You know what I want. I've been waiting for this moment for years. Why did you kill my husband? Ilya asked. And why did you kill those people? They didn't do anything to you. It's simple, Gagnan replied. Your husband was no longer useful to me. Same with Monsieur Holder, although I didn't kill him personally, I ordered it. A woman, she was an extra link that needed to be eliminated. Nothing more. What do you mean, when you say Philip was no longer useful? Ilya asked, perplexed. His job was to keep an eye on you, Gagnan replied. Who do you think arranged for you to meet at that corporate event in Montreal? Who do you think always made sure he was available to invite you? Who arranged your so-called wedding? What? This doesn't make sense. Ilya exclaimed, growing angry. Gagnan laughed a mad laugh. Seriously? You've seen the women he slept with? Do you really think he'd ever look twice at someone like you? When was the last time you wore makeup or did your hair? Do you know how to use hairspray? Nails? You're nothing compared to the beauties Philip attracted. I don't need these things, Ilya said in her usual monotone voice. And what do you mean by so-called wedding? We were married. I have all the documents. All the documents are fake, Gagnan stated coldly. And this was all orchestrated by me, just to ruin your little fantasy. I don't believe you. Iliot suddenly shouted. It was real. 
He loved me. I loved him. How could such a man even love you? Gagman sneered. And what do you know about love? You don't even know how to smile. Philip told me how you couldn't even sleep in the same bed with him, and how you don't wear earrings or have a dress. He said that when he remembered you in bed, he'd always ask for the lights to be off, or just one candle. Why do you think he always made love to you at night with the lights off or by the light of one candle? He said that this way, he could imagine any face instead of yours. I dreamed of making love to you myself, Gagnan said with a sick grin, but seeing you now, I couldn't bring myself to do it. It would be like, like making love to a patient in a mental hospital or a cat lady from a homeless shelter. Were you involved in that lab we busted five years ago? Ilya asked coldly, ignoring his words. With great difficulty, Ryan stood frozen like a statue, watching what was happening. His eyes darted between them, trying to gauge the best time to intervene. Of course, Gagnan said. Who do you think set off those explosives that disabled you? And now I intend to finish what I started. You are a crazy, despicable little man, Ilya spat, and I mean that in every degrading way you can imagine. Do you really think that killing me will bring Emily back to life? Her tone was barely restrained. Of course not, Gagnan replied, his voice dripping with malice. And this may be the last thing I do, but I'll die a happy man knowing that you're dead too. Now stay still so I can get a clean shot. A shootout ensued, during which Roland saved Elia, but he was wounded. Jean-Pierre was dead. Roland tried to say something, but Elia stopped him. Don't talk, man. Save your strength, Elia said surprisingly tenderly. Please don't leave me. I just found you. I can't lose you too. I love you, my dear Roland. As Ryan and Bill looked at her, tears streamed down Elia's face. It was the first genuine display of emotion they had ever seen from her. Ryan wondered where those feelings were when she learned of Philip's death. Suddenly, Elia began to tremble all over. She threw her head back and let out a terrible scream that sent shivers down Ryan's spine. Ryan remembered her asking if Philip's tears would bring him back to life. Seeing her reaction to Roland's injuries, he began to think that this might indeed be true. Roland briefly regained consciousness from her scream, then fell back into unconsciousness. At that moment, the ambulance arrived in the backyard, and paramedics rushed to Roland. They immediately began administering first aid and preparing to transport him to the hospital. Ilya grabbed one of the medics. I'll go with him, she told the male medic. Sorry, miss, you can follow us, but you can't be in the ambulance, he replied. Damn it, I'm not your miss. I'm Sergeant Ilya Dupont of the Quebec Police, and I'm going with you. Do you understand me? She growled, grabbing him by the collar, her face red with rage. Ah, yes, madam, if you insist, he quickly conceded, clearly fearing for his life. The paramedics placed Roland on a stretcher and loaded him into the ambulance. Ilya quickly jumped inside, not paying attention to anything else. I'll catch up with you, Ryan said before the doors closed. Ilya nodded, keeping her eyes on Roland as the ambulance drove off with its lights and sirens on. Ryan, Smith, and Bill walked up to Jean Pierre's corpse and looked at it. I think we got him, Smith said sarcastically. And I didn't even get to read him his rights, Ryan joked. He took out his phone and called the forensic expert on duty. When he finished, Ranger Wilson, several sheriff's deputies, and National Guard soldiers arrived in his yard. As I said, Sheriff, you certainly have a unique way of solving problems, Wilson remarked. Seems like it, Ryan replied. 5.30 a.m., Monday, September 26, 2022. The patient is coming out of anesthesia from surgery, Sheriff Caldwell, Dr. Hansen said as he emerged from the operating room. How is he? Ryan asked. He's been critical for some time, but the next 24 hours will be decisive. However, I am optimistic. I think you should keep an eye on Mrs. Dupont. She is in a bad state at the moment. I doubt she has moved since the orderly put her on the chair. Thank you, doctor. I'll take care of it. When do you think we can see him? I'd let him rest today. We're going to keep him sedated for a while. Maybe tomorrow morning. Okay, doctor, thank you. 
Smith approached Ryan after hearing Dr. Hansen's last words. So he's out of surgery? Yes, Ryan replied. What's the news? Worldwide is officially closed. The police and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police began operations early this morning, just as everyone was getting ready for their morning coffee. French authorities have closed the main office. Now it's up to the prosecutors. Do you think it's possible to relieve the tension? Ryan asked. I think so, Smith said. Are you going back to Washington? Yeah. I have nothing else to do here, but I would appreciate some breakfast. I think we can arrange that. Biscuits and gravy. Sally makes them every morning, said Ryan. I'll treat you. In that case, absolutely, Smith said with a smile. My wife isn't here, so she won't stop me from pampering myself. Okay, let me pick up Elia and Bill, and we'll go, Ryan said. After he convinced them that there was nothing more that could be done at the hospital, they went to Sally's Cafe, where they enjoyed breakfast and coffee at Ryan's expense. They then returned home. What's the plan? Beverly asked as Ryan got ready to shower. I'll take Smith to the office. He's flying back east, and I'll be busy with paperwork and press interviews all day. I'll stop by on the way home to see how Roland is doing, but I don't think he'll be awake until tomorrow morning, said Ryan. How's Ilya holding up? She asked. In the hospital, she was calm as always. Quiet. Huh, very. Ryan replied, maybe even too quiet. Keep an eye on her, okay? It worries me a little. Me too. I have deliveries to make in the morning. Maybe I'll take her and Bill with me. Good idea. It might help distract them, Ryan said. How are you holding up? It's not every day there's a shooting in my yard to this extent, Beverly noted. But I'm fine, Ryan said. I'll return home as soon as I can. I love you so much, Beverly said. I love you more, he replied. As Ryan predicted, it turned out to be a very busy day. After lifting the alert and speaking with the press, where Ryan thanked the police, the Rangers, the National Guard, all the deputies, and the governor, he went to his office, where he spent the rest of the day filling out reports. That afternoon, Deputy Sanders knocked on his door. Come in, Ryan called. Sheriff, we still have Grayson in custody. What do you want to do with him? Damn, I forgot about him when all this started, Ryan said, annoyed. He thought for a moment. My gut says he needs to be held. Contact Ron and see what he found. I'm tempted to charge this idiot with conspiracy, obstruction of justice, or at least aiding and abetting. At a minimum, he must have known Gagnan had his own plan, and he provided cover and a place to live. Will you take it on? Of course, Sanders said. Great. This will be good practice for you when you become a sergeant, Ryan said with a smile. Sergeant? Sanders asked, surprised. He knew that he had passed the exam, but he was not aware that Ryan had already applied for a promotion, not just a sergeant, but to detective sergeant. Do you think you can handle it? Hell yes, Sanders beamed. Linda will be glad to hear that, he added, referring to his wife. Oh, and Greg, Ryan added, rarely addressing Sanders by name. Keep it a secret for now, okay? I'll make an official announcement soon. I will, Sheriff. I'll look very surprised when you make the announcement, Sanders chuckled as he left the office. Ryan continued filling out reports, only stopping when there was another knock on the door. Come in, Ryan called. How are you holding up, Sheriff? Ray Hale asked as he entered the office. I could use a day or two of rest, but other than that, I'm fine. By the way, thanks for coordinating the support last night. I know you had a hard time with Ranger Wilson and the National Guard. Glad to help, Ryan said. By the way, how's your friend? Doc says he's optimistic. We'll know more in a day or so. Which reminds me, I need to kick Frank Barnes fifth place for denying my request for a vest upgrade. If we had what I asked for, Roland would probably not be in the hospital. Perhaps, or perhaps not. As far as I understand, Gagnan used armor-piercing ammunition. Still, it would be nice to have something better than that old third-level vest, Ryan hissed. 
I'll leave it to you, Sheriff, Ray said with a hint of irony. This is above my salary. Ryan chuckled. I'll let you get back to work. Just wanted to check on you. Thanks, Ray, Ryan said as the detective left the office. How are you holding up, dear? Beverly asked Delia as she sat at the table, looking at the cup of coffee in front of her. She had barely touched it in the half hour since Beverly poured it. I keep thinking about what Jean-Pierre said last night, Elias said quietly. He was right. I don't know how to be a woman. I'm not someone a man can love. This is complete nonsense, and you know it, Beverly said sincerely, sitting down across from her. He was just trying to make you angry. Ilya looked at Beverly with a raised eyebrow, not understanding. Even after more than a year in this city, she still had trouble understanding how these Texans spoke. You know it makes you angry, Beverly continued. He definitely did it. Ilya agreed with a shrug. But that doesn't change what he said. And he's right. Didn't your mom teach you anything when you were growing up? Beverly asked. Ilya sighed. She was too busy with men to teach me anything. Beverly paused, shocked. The phrase was spoken so casually that she thought for a moment she had misheard her. My father tried his best after her death, but he was too overwhelmed by his own grief to be of any help. He told me to focus on my studies and service. Those were the things I needed to make a living. That's what I did. Ilya looked at Beverly with sad, pain eyes. Will you help me? Help you with what? Beverly asked. Help me become a woman someone can love, Elia asked hopefully. You mean Roland, right? Beverly asked softly. Yes, Elia answered quietly. You really love him, huh? I feel something stronger than I've ever felt for anyone. Even Philip. Is this wrong? No. From what I heard, Philip is dead, and he was just using you, Beverly said. Let me make one call. Wait here. Beverly went to the kitchen and made a call. Hello, Burnus. This is Beverly Caldwell. Can you do me a favor, please? 6 p.m., Monday, September 26th, 2022, Caldwell House. Tired, Ryan entered the house, dreaming of a quiet evening. As always, Beverly greeted him with a hot kiss. As he returned the kiss, he saw another beautiful blonde entering the room, wearing a long boho dress. At first, he didn't recognize her. Ilya? Ryan asked incredulously. Yes, it's me, Ilya answered, her voice immediately giving her away. What do you think? Beverly asked, nudging him. W what happened? Ryan asked. He had never seen her in a dress, and her hair had been washed, cut, and styled. She also wore makeup, not much, but enough, and he noticed her nails were painted red. She's beautiful, Beverly said with a smile. Well, of course, she's beautiful, Beverly added, smiling as Elliot smiled sheepishly. She was always beautiful. Burnus just helped bring that out. Burnus? Your friend who has a salon on Main Street. The same one, Beverly confirmed. Do you think Roland will appreciate it? Ryan asked. He and about 99% of the male population of Hard Rock will, Ryan said. The remaining 1% are either old, blind, or happily married, he quickly added. Hell, I might have to appoint a deputy to keep the suitors away. Beverly laughed at this. I can take care of myself, Elia answered in her usual monotone voice. I have no doubt about that, Ryan told her. Are you going to visit Roland tomorrow? If he's able to, then yes, Elia said. Okay, why don't you and Bill go with Beverly tomorrow morning and visit him after her deliveries? That's our plan, Beverly confirmed. Ryan turned to Bill, who could hardly take his eyes off Elia's figure, now in full view. Your job, young man, is to protect the two most beautiful women in Hard Rock tomorrow. Understood? Ryan ordered sternly, but with a wide smile. That's right, Sheriff. Bill replied, giving a mock salute. 9 a.m., Tuesday, September 27th, 2022, Hard Rock Hospital. Roland had just woken up when he heard the door to his room open. He saw two beautiful blondes enter the room and stop at his bed. 
Behind them stood a man, Bill, whom Roland recognized. Beverly Caldwell was with him, but Roland did not immediately recognize the woman who was with her. You're awake, Ilya said, looking at him. Yeah, I just woke up. Thought I died and went to heaven for a second. Why did you think that? You're certainly alive, Ilya said sternly. Seeing two beautiful angels like you. Roland said. I'm not an angel, Ilya replied. You could have fooled me, Roland said, making her blush. Hey, buddy, how are you feeling? Bill asked. It's like I've been shot, Roland responded sarcastically. Still pretty tired. What happened? Well, after Gagnan shot you, we destroyed him with extreme prejudice. I don't think there was anything left of him to bury, Bill said. Okay. I take it you're all okay? Roland asked, looking around at everyone, as if he was counting heads. Yeah, we're fine. We were just worried about you, Beverly said. Don't worry. It's been worse. Yes, I remember, Roland said. Well, we better take Bill back home, Beverly added. Ryan said he'll come over if you're conscious. I need to pack our things and get the car, but I'll be back soon, Bill said. Aren't you going with them? Roland asked Delia. No, I think we need to talk, she replied. Roland suddenly realized it was a setup, but he wasn't upset. He was glad to have some alone time with Elia. Of course, Roland said. Bill and Beverly said their goodbyes and left the room. Roland looked at Elia and noted her beauty. You, you look, how do I say this? Oh, yes, magnifique. Did I say that right? Yes, you said it right, Elia replied, but your accent is terrible. We will work on your French. I can handle it, Roland said seriously. You look beautiful. I didn't know you had that dress. This is the first one I've had in a long time, Elia said softly. Your hair looks good too, so soft. And I love that color on your nails. Thank you. Berna spent almost an hour detangling my hair. I wanted it to be beautiful for you, she said quietly. Is it because of what Gagnan said last night? If that's the case, you should know that I've always thought you were beautiful. Is it true? She asked, almost in bewilderment. Yes, Roland said. My ex-wives were beautiful on the outside, but they were cunning and deceitful, nothing beautiful on the inside. You, on the other hand, I find your honesty and sincerity more beautiful than anything else. Thank you. That's the kindest thing anyone has ever said to me. Ilya paused, looking away. I will admit, though, I like how it all makes me feel. It makes me feel like a woman who can be loved. She fell silent, clearly embarrassed, as if admitting weakness. Roland reached out and gently touched her hand. That's because you're as beautiful on the outside as you are on the inside, he said softly. I could look at you like that all day. He saw a tear threatening to roll down her cheek. Are you okay? Last night, I was afraid that I would lose you, she said. The way you saved me, no one has ever done anything like that for me. Well, to be honest, I don't think I could live with myself if something happened to you. I knew I had to do something. I can't tell you how glad I am that you weren't hurt. Ilya looked at Roland for a few moments, then said something that surprised him. He saw thoughts flashing through her head. Do you think we could be together? She asked hesitantly. I can't think of anything I'd like more, Roland said. There's only one condition, I am a one-woman man, and I refuse to share. I like this arrangement much better than the one I had with Philip, Elia said. And I'd like to be what you Americans call a one-man woman, but I'm not very good at baking cookies or anything else. We'll figure it out. Maybe we can learn together, Roland said. I would like that, Elia said, smiling through her tears. I would really like to. Now, are you ready for your first French lesson? Of course, Elia whispered in a soft voice. Jame. I like the way you say it, Roland told her. What does it mean? This means, I love you, Roland Waters, Elia said. Now, you say it, she urged. Shutem, Roland replied. I love you, Elia, he said softly, smiling. She smiled back at him, then kissed him. 
I like to hear you say that, Roland said. Then I'll whisper it in your ear every night, if you want, she said quietly. I want to, Roland said, surprised by her gentle tone. They spent the next hour talking. Then, they heard a knock on the door. Bill poked his head inside. Are you two dressed decently? He asked with a grin. Yes, Roland said, as Elias sat down. I'm not interrupting anything, am I? Bill asked with feigned innocence. Oh, just my first French lesson, Roland said, and Elia blushed. French? Right, is that what they call it now? Bill joked. They both laughed at this. They chatted a little more, but soon Roland felt tired. A nurse entered the room to check on his condition. It's time to take your medicine. The doctor will be in soon, the nurse said. When do you think he'll be discharged? Bill asked. It depends on the doctor, but if everything goes well, he could be discharged in a week, the nurse replied. Now, if you don't mind, I need to take care of our patient, she added. It's time for us to leave anyway, Bill said. See you tomorrow. Sounds great, Roland replied. I'll be a little late tomorrow, Elias said. I have an appointment to remove a tattoo, if that's okay with you. Not at all. Merci beaucoup, Roland said with a knowing smile. You're welcome, Elia replied, squeezing his hand before leaving the room. The next few weeks were very busy for everyone. Life in Hard Rock returned to normal. Ryan became a local celebrity, being interviewed several times by national television networks and even re-recognized by the governor. Elia had completed her report to her commander in Quebec and was busy packing in anticipation of the move. After a thorough check of the documents, Elia learned that her marriage to Philippe was legal, despite Jean Pierre's words. She sighed with relief, realizing that this would greatly simplify dealing with his inheritance. An investigation into Worldwide's criminal activities revealed that approximately half of the company's employees were not directly involved in illegal activities but either knew or suspected something and simply turned a blind eye. Philippe fell into this category, but he was aware of Jean Pierre's interest in Elia. Emails, text messages, and interviews with other employees showed that Philippe had pursued Elia at Gagnon's insistence, regularly feeding him information. Ryan took Beverly to an expensive dinner and dance for her birthday, ending the evening in their bedroom. Roland was discharged from the hospital after a 10-day stay. Ryan, Beverly, Bill, and Elia arrived to see him off. Is he allowed to have a night? Elia asked the doctor directly, as if she were asking about the weather. It's not too stressful yet, the doctor answered sheepishly. Okay, thank you, Elia replied before they left the room. That night, Elia surprised Roland. Thursday, October 6, 2022, Eastland Bridge. Elia sat up when she heard the truck door slam shut. She stood up as Ryan walked around the front of the truck. What can I do for you, Sheriff? She asked. I received a call that a strange woman was standing in the middle of the bridge. I thought it was you, because you are the strangest woman I have ever met. Ilya smiled at the joke. Oh, she's still smiling, and her face isn't even cracked, he added with a wide smile. I didn't see any cars. Who called you? She asked. Ryan pointed to the sky. Air Patrol. I have eyes everywhere, you know. So, what are you doing here? I wanted to visit the place where Philippe was found. I thought I could make one last connection. Yeah, guess you didn't succeed, he said. No. I thought you should be halfway to Quebec by now. What's holding you back? I'm leaving tomorrow morning to accompany Philippe's remains to Kala. It's the least I can do for his family, she said. From there, I'll return to Quebec. I was offered a position as a researcher in the cyber division. Apparently, they were impressed with my work here. At least you won't have to deal with paperwork. No, they will allow me to keep my rank and seniority, but I will be a junior member of the team. I was told that in a few months I will undergo additional training. It's not field work, but at least it's something useful. What about Roland? Ryan asked. He's coming home to take care of things here. He asked me to give you something if I saw you, she said, walking to the trunk of her car. She opened it, took out something, then closed the trunk. 
Ryan saw Roland's bag and immediately knew it contained his favorite Thompson machine gun. What is this? Ryan asked, surprised. This is his Thompson, along with all the accessories, Elia said. He doesn't need it anymore, and they won't let him into Canada anyway. Canada? Ryan asked. Yes. He's joining me in Quebec after he's settled his affairs here in the States. Ryan knew how much that weapon meant to Roland. Any woman who could soften this man enough for him to give it away had to be someone very special. Is this forever? He asked in shock. I hope so. He says it is, and I believe him. You too? Yes, we're a couple. And no, we won't have the same agreement that I had with Philippe. Congratulations, Ryan said sincerely. Then, are you happy? I'm happier than I've ever been, Elia replied in her signature monotone tone, but Ryan saw the contentment on her face. She looked around, gazing at the countryside. I'm going to miss this place. I love it. Hot and dry in the summer, cold and mostly dry in the winter. The last time we saw snow was February 2021. Ilya chuckled. Perfect. I hate snow. I hate walking in it, and I hate cleaning it up. I can never get warm. So why do you stay here if you hate snow? Ryan asked. This is my home, she replied, like yours here. But maybe when I retire in 12 years, we'll come back. We will miss you. Feel free to come whenever you want. You will always be a welcome guest in our home, Ryan said. Thank you, Sheriff. It means a lot to me. And to Roland too. And tell Roland that I'll take good care of his gift. I have just the place for it in our arsenal. I'll tell him. I know it will make him happy, she said, turning to leave and holding out her hand to Ryan. He was surprised, knowing her dislike of physical contact. It's time for me to say goodbye, Sheriff. I still have a lot to do before I leave, she added in an official tone. Goodbye, Elia, Ryan said quietly, shaking her hand. Her grip was stronger than he expected, almost like a man's. In a strange way, he felt sad when she broke the handshake and returned to her car. Suddenly, she stopped, turned around sharply, and looked at Ryan, searchingly, for a few moments. Then she quickly walked toward him, as soon as her prosthetic leg would allow, and threw herself around his neck. Thank you, Ryan, for everything. And tell Beverly I thank her too, she said. I'll definitely tell her, Ryan replied, feeling her tears on his cheek. But you can tell her yourself. It will hurt her if you leave without saying goodbye to her. Elia released him, nodded in understanding, and returned to her car. Ryan watched as she turned around, wiped her face, and drove back to the city. For a moment, Ryan felt empty, as if he had just said goodbye to a family member leaving forever. He looked around the countryside when the wind suddenly rose. A chill ran down his spine, and he felt as if someone was watching him. Then, he heard a quiet voice coming from nowhere. Remember, son, that justice always goes with you, said the voice. The wind suddenly died down, and Ryan felt lonely. He put Roland's machine gun in the back seat of his truck and got back behind the wheel. I guess so, Ryan said quietly, before driving back to town. As for the last part about the channel and the story, if you intend for it to be part of the narrative, it might be better to make it clearer whether it's breaking the fourth wall or if it's meant to be a transition. Here's a potential rewording if you'd like to keep it.